Phil, David, you highlighted maintenance. And Andrew, you published some nice data with thalidomide maintenance showing survival benefit. You mentioned the, uh, you published the lenalidomide story showing survival advantage in the meta-analysis, not in the uh, specific trials. And I believe, David, you're not very keen on maintenance. That's correct. So can I have your opinion, guys, on uh, where to take it from here? Yeah, I think that um, our historical data highlighted the inadequacy of the therapies available at the time because the benefit with the post-transferent thalidomide was that it pushed people into deeper levels of response. It was a consolidative approach. Um, and I think that even now with lenalidomide, um, there is a substantial proportion of patients who get a consolidative effect with deepening response. We've had some patients on trials out at three years converting to CR on lenalidomide. That comes at a cost, not only financial, but also low-grade toxicities. And a lot of patients elect to stop their uh, maintenance lenalidomide. So I think there is evidence that it will prolong PFS. And you recommend it? Well, I, 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 would, um, I would talk to the patient about its role. I wouldn't push it on the patient, but I would discuss it with the patient. And if they were happy to pursue that, I would do that. Um, and for not, how long? Continuously probably or for until, a limited yeah, duration? Until relapse or until they became uh, intolerant and decided to stop. But I think there is reasonable evidence that it will prolong that progression-free interval. What about you, Dr. McCarthy? Uh, yeah, I'm a believer in maintenance until progression. I'm actually doing that as a debate topic tomorrow, or no, on Sunday. Uh, but. I think we know enough for patients who, A, tolerate the drug, don't have side effects, as Andrew mentioned. Uh, and uh, as long as I understand, there is a risk of a second primary cancer uh, higher than uh, if you don't get maintenance. But there's a benefit in terms of prolonged disease-free survival and um, overall survival. So again, it's something you discuss with the patient. You dose appropriately because if you push it, and you have a patient who has cytopenias, you're not doing them any favor. Or if they have intolerable toxicity, it's not something you should continue to push on the patient. We do have other options, such as bortezomib and some other things, which potentially can be utilized. We don't do it as often because of toxicity. And I think we need to continue studying this. And as you know, there are, there are options now with daratumumab. There will be other drugs that will be tested. I, I ascribe to the idea of continuous exposure to these patients because, again, we don't know who the ones are who don't need this. And until we do, I think we need to treat the majority of patients with some type of maintenance therapy. Okay, David, let me go back to my, you know, patient who is very curious, you know, questioning everything. He or she wants to be involved in her treatment. So uh, this patient is telling you, oh, Doc, you're not recommending me to take maintenance, and I just read that there are drugs which has a label by FDA and, you know, European agencies worldwide. What are your arguments? Well, the, so... It, it, it's a very long and complex argument. The, the short version is that the, the studies that, that looked at this have flaws. The, there's no question that there is. And, and there, there's also no question that at the time of, uh, of relapse, it can be a more difficult therapeutic in, environment because of If this, they have received maintenance. If they've, if they've had uh, maintenance therapy. And the, the reality of it is that at the current time, we see a, a therapeutic landscape that is changing dramatically. Um, the, uh, the, the number of options that the next generation of myeloma physicians and the next generation of myeloma survivors, and we have more and more of them, um, is going to be completely different. And the, the notion that we would risk engendering higher levels of resistance for, for, for patients as they approach this, uh, this you know, uh, extraordinary landscape of new therapies. I, I find it a little bit um, pessimistic view of the world. 
I, I would say, I mean, I would agree with you that it would be worrying to do maintenance, to generate resistance to lenalidomide, and then uh, I'm stuck if I don't have any other option. But now, uh, if you generate resistance to lenalidomide, uh, continuous therapy, but you have many other options, I guess. Is this, but doesn't the, this make you comfortable? Uh, it, it does. Uh, of, cor of course it does. I mean, having okay. choices is a wonderful thing. Um, ha having said that, one of the things that we understand about myeloma is that becoming resistance resistant to one modality translates into becoming resistant to other modalities at some level. I mean, if you treat a patient with, a de novo patient with bortezomib, the response rate is 90%. But if you come to, the, to that patient after they failed lenalidomide, the response rate is substantially lower. So it, it, it's very complicated, and I don't pretend to, 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 to say that, that there, there aren't arguments in both directions. But one of the flaws in our system, and I think we've all come to recognize that high-risk patients probably don't benefit from the standard way that we do. The, 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 the labeled uh, uh, maintenance therapy is low-dose lenalidomide. And I think we come to understand that that is probably not the best thing to do for our high-risk patients. So this is really an important point. Well, but, but understand that in the United States, the, the community um, doesn't identify who the high-risk patients are. So in, in a big institution, if they, if they go to, 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 uh, to Roswell Park, the, the, the likelihood of missing that they're a high-risk patient is probably low. But, but out there in the community, they pick up one-third, one-quarter of the high-risk patients because they don't do the analysis appropriately. So, the, so as they put patients on maintenance therapy, they're, they're probably doing it inappropriately in the most important patients, the high-risk patients, the ones that, uh, uh, that we, we have to be most concerned about. The rest of the patients have every right to expect to live 10 years, 20 years, perhaps longer than that, no matter what we do. So it's a, it's a very complicated question for which there is probably no easy answer. Phil, what kind of maintenance do you propose to the high-risk cytogenetics? Uh, well, well, two things. First, uh, with regard to LEN resistance, at least we know the PFS2 is still superior if you receive maintenance, and that the overall survival after relapse is the same. So with the availability of new drugs. Well, with, that's as exactly long as the point. You, oh, no, and to David's point is you need to have availability of new drugs. Right. So as long as that environment is there, yes. Now, with regards to high risk, I certainly uh, ascribe to the fact that single agent bortezomib or lenalidomide is inadequate. Uh, we've seen so you that. You would rather prefer a combination. I would, because I think that, again, most high risk patients' stratifications are about 10 to 20 percent are those who really need something more. And so those something more patients definitely need. I believe, a combination. Is there data for that? No, but I think there's enough worry because these patients do progress pretty quickly. That single agent, whatever you're using, is inadequate, and we need to study new strategies to control these diseases. Do you these agree, patients. Andrew? Yeah, we've got our own data showing that, for example, patients with 1Q amplification get virtually no benefit at all from lenalidomide maintenance, and that's a substantial proportion of the patients harbor that mm -hmm abnormality. Ironically, uh, we would put people on maintenance purely to satisfy the failure of that drug to acquire subsequent therapies, mm -hmm. uh, which doesn't sound particularly scientific, but it's, it's what we have to mm -hmm. do. So we would give people lenalidomide uh, with a view to knowing that they probably won't get substantial benefit, but at least it will enable us to access more effective therapies subsequently. Well, gentlemen, that was a wonderful debate. Uh, I can reasonably conclude, I think, that transplant is here to stay for the time being. Of course, the landscape is changing rapidly. Uh, obviously, the maintenance issues, the subgroups, are still a matter of debate, although majority of colleagues usually recommend some form of post-transplant therapy, let's say, to be 
So thank you very much and please enjoy the rest of the meeting.